Welcome back to the science part of the show, which I know doesn't happen nearly as frequently as it should, but we're working on that. So today to celebrate the end of pencil month, we're going to do something that I probably should have done at the beginning of pencil month, which is talk about how pencils actually work, the science behind pencils. So I'm going to be going through um, kind of from the most basic parts and then into what actually makes up a pencil. So first we're going to look at the basic element that makes pencils right, which is the graphite within the core. And then we'll kind of go from there as to how our pencil core is made, how do they write, what makes them write, things like that. So to start out with, we need to talk about graphite. Graphite is the really what makes a pencil work. That's what the core is made out of for the most part. That's what makes the marks that we see on the paper. So graphite is an allotrope of carbon. An allotrope is um, basically a, an, an allotrope of an element is a different uh, physical structure that the atoms can form into um, for the same element. So allotropes of carbon are um, graphite, diamond, etc, um, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So carbon, right? Carbon, we represent chemically with just a C. And I'm going to draw a little Lewis dot structure. Yay, chemistry. Basically what this is, is this is a very simplified view of how carbon works. Each of these dots represents, basically it represents a bond that carbon wants to make. Carbon wants to make four bonds with other things and then it's happy. And so the way that this usually looks, if I were to draw, let's say methane, which is carbon connected to four hydrogens, is I'd have a carbon, I'd have a hydrogen, I'd have a hydrogen. This right now is flat, right? It's flat in the paper. Then I'd have another hydrogen that would be coming out of the paper. That's what this wedge means. And then I'd have another hydrogen that would be going back into the paper. So this is a three-dimensional drawing on a two-dimensional sheet of paper. This is what carbon is usually happy with. It wants to form four bonds, and that's a three-dimensional structure. However, when carbon forms graphite, that's not the case. Graphite is a two-dimensional, well, it's a three-dimensional structure, but it's made up of two-dimensional layers of carbon. So, building blocks of graphite. So if you guys remember, I think it was maybe a few years ago now, there was a bunch of hubbub in the science world about this thing called graphene. So graphene is basically a single layer of graphite. So single layer of graphite. Graphite is multi-layered. It's kind of like a cake, right? You make up graphite with layers and layers of graphene. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I draw the structure of a single layer of graphene, it forms what we call a honeycomb lattice. So that basically means that the carbon molecules, which are now being represented just by little dots because I don't want to draw that many C's, form a hexagonal structure. So I'll start, start drawing the bonds in. Each of these lines represents a bond between carbons. Did I screw this up already? I did, I screwed this up, okay. Let's try this again. My chemistry is a little rusty, so bear with me. Okay, so here's a single hexagon. So now here's the next one. With these carbon molecules, or atoms. Okay, and then we draw another one. Made up of carbon atoms. And then we draw another one. Right, so it just continues like that. But if you see here, let's take a look at this carbon right here. It has a bond to this carbon, has a bond to this carbon, and it has a bond to that carbon. That's only three bonds. Well, I just said over here, the carbon wants to make four bonds. So this means that now there are extra electrons floating around in this material. And that gives graphite some very cool properties. It makes it electrically conductive. It gives it cool thermal properties, but that's for a whole nother day. Basically, 
what happens is when you have graphene, you have the this flat honeycomb structure of carbon atoms bonded to other carbon atoms. Okay, that's great. When you start stacking those, then you get graphite. So I'm gonna to switch to a different color. So I'm gonna grab a red colored pencil and I'm gonna start drawing the layer that would be underneath or on top of this. It doesn't really matter. So basically the way that one works is they stagger themselves. So these red dots are still carbon atoms, but they're carbon atoms in a different layer now. And there's gonna be another carbon atom underneath this one. So we're gonna get some bonds that look like that. And then there'll be another carbon atom underneath or on top of that one. And then on underneath or on top of that one. So you can see that hexagon forming yet again. So then there would also be a, another one right here. And then another one in the center over here, another one there. So right, so now you can see another hexagon forming, but slightly offset from the first one. And they'll just keep stacking like that. And how the um, layers offset, that is another kind of issue entirely, but basically they're gonna keep stacking up on top of each other slightly offset. They won't just stack flat on top of each other. So if we look at this, the bonds between carbons in any given layer, so in the red layer or in the regular pencil layer, um, are very strong. These are called covalent bonds. These are strong, so strong. However, the bonds between this red layer and the gray layer are not very strong. Those are what's called van der Waal forces, van der Waal bonds. They're not really bonds at all. It's, I won't get into the chemistry of it all, but basically these, guy, these two layers are just being very weakly held together. So what that means is that one layer of graphite can slough off of the rest of it very easily. And that's actually how I believe they originally isolated graphene was they just drew really dark with a pencil. So you had a bunch of graphite and then they just stuck a piece of tape on it and peeled off a single layer. So what bonds between layers Bonds between layers are weak, which is great. That means that you can easily slide one layer of graphite off of the next layer. Awesome. Okay, so that's as much as we're gonna talk about with graphite itself. So let's kind of section off our page. So now let's talk about what makes up an actual pencil core because it's not just graphite. So pencil cores. Pencil cores. That's the problem sometimes when I write in cursive is I get too excited and I leave out letters. So pencil cores, what are they? They are a mix of graphite and clay. And sometimes I add letters. Anyway, and that's just, that's not even a word. That's not even clay. That's not even close to spelling clay. There we go. So basically what they do is they make these big, huge slabs of graphite and clay that in a very special industrialized way that doesn't really matter. The point is they, they make graphite and clay and then they smash it up really, really small so that the individual particles then that they use to actually put in a pencil core are approximately 10 microns in size. 10 microns is really small. Um, I would love to have a comparison for you, but I don't have that ready. But 10 microns is really small. If you think about how big a millimeter is, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. So this 10 microns is a hundredth of a millimeter. So try and picture that right now. It's really hard. They're, so they're very small. These are very small particle sizes. And so that way when they mix the graphite and the clay, that means that they get a very nice uniform mixture. You're not gonna get big chunks of just graphite or just clay, which is good, right? That means our pencils write nicely. So with this mix, the more clay you have, the harder your graphite. So more, or sorry, the harder your core. So more clay equals harder lead. Because graphite, 
like I said, it's not super strongly bonded together. So graphite by itself is kind of crumbly, kind of weak, not ideal for making pencil cores out of by itself. So they add the clay to help bind things together. And they add other stuff too, which is, you know can affect the color or how it writes and things like that. But primarily we're talking graphite and clay. So yeah, so more clay means harder lead, less clay, softer lead. So as you get into the B range of pencils, that means you have more graphite. As you get into the H range of pencils, that means that you have more clay. Yeah. Um, sorry, there's a fly buzzing around my head. So that's what I'm doing off camera is furiously swatting at a fly. So, okay, so they crush up the stuff into these 10 micron sized particles and then they mix it together with a whole bunch of other stuff and they do this fancy schmancy industrial process. And then what they do is they shape the clay, graphite, and other stuff mixture into the pencil cores, basically what you see in your pencil. And then they fire those in a kiln um, to dry them out and harden them like you would do with any other pottery. And after that process, then they are placed in the slats and glued and cut and all of that stuff. And that's a whole different issue. I don't really care about that here because that's secondary. That doesn't affect really how the pencil writes. It just affects how you hold the pencil. So, okay, so that's how we make pencil cores. Sweet. So now let's talk a little bit about paper. Paper, even the really nice smooth papers like this Rhodia paper that I'm using right now, is actually very rough on its surface. Paper is made of fibers and those fibers basically overlap on the surface of the paper. So I'm gonna very just roughly kind of draw what that looks like. So I'm gonna have some things going that way and some things going that way. and. Basically, paper looks like this, if you have a really zoomed in picture of the surface of paper. It's a mess, it looks like that, right? It feels smooth when you write on it, but in reality, it's very rough, and there's lots of different paper fibers going all different directions, and that's good for us, because that's what makes pencils write. So what happens is when you are writing with your pencil, little bits of that graphite clay mixture basically rub off onto the paper and get stuck in these little paper fibers. So again, I'm going to go back to my red. So this is going to be my little pieces of graphite. So my little pieces of graphite are going to get rubbed off my pencil and they're going to just kind of sink into those little paper fibers. Some of them might stay on the surface. Some of them might find their way kind of into a little hole and they might really get wedged in there. So my little graphite pieces are gonna get all over in the paper. They're gonna nestle their way in and they'll probably move around a little bit over time, you know, brownie in motion and all that. But the point is my little graphite pieces get caught in the paper and that's what allows me to leave marks. It's the same thing with this red colored pencil. There's pigments and such in, in this. And those little pigments get caught in the paper and that's what allows them to make a mark. As opposed to like a liquid pen ink which stains the paper, which is different. So this is kind of how pigmented inks work and pigmented things like pencils and colored pencils. So that's how that works. And that's why pencil is so permanent short of being erased because these little guys are stuck physically in the paper. So why is pencil waterproof? Well, if I get water on the paper, water is a polar solvent. Graphite by itself is not that polar. So it has no reason to go with the water. It's just gonna stay stuck in with the paper, which is probably a better home than the water. It's also why it's UV resistant is because the marks that pencil leaves on paper is actually chunks of this graphite here. And UV energy is not gonna do much to break up actual atoms. It's an atomic structure, so it's not gonna break that down. As opposed to molecular structures that you have in ink, those can be broken down in sunlight. So that's why pencil is so permanent. It's why it's water resistant, UV resistant, heat resistant for the most part, um, is because those, those little pencil particles actually get into the paper and wedge themselves in the paper like that. That is, okay, so now we get to erasers. So erasers, of course, erase pencil. So the way that they do that is when you have an eraser, 
it's some sort of soft kind of material like rubber or some sort of soft plastic, right? And what you do is you rub that across the paper, right? You rub, 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 rub. And that heats up the eraser, right? You're, you're giving, you're creating friction. So that creates heat, heats up the eraser. That softens the rubber or whatever other gunk is in the eraser. And that allows that to then grab onto the pencil particles that are stuck in the paper. So basically when I rub this and heat this up, then I can grab these little pencil particles and pull them out of the paper fibers. That's also why if you, um, if you rub paper with your finger, like if you rub where you've written with pencil, you can also really move that pencil around and smear that pencil because you're doing the same thing. Now you're creating heat with friction and now you're giving those graphite particles a little bit of energy. You're giving the you know particles in your skin a little bit of energy and it allows the graphite to move around within the surface of the paper. That's also why when you um, like write on top of the back of a piece of paper that you've already written on, you can transfer pencil marks from one side to the other. Same thing. Now you are squishing this paper against another surface of paper and there's nothing to stop these graphite particles from moving to one to another piece of paper. So erasers, uh, basically heat from rubbing, which in pretty much every other area of life is not such a good thing. Like running, oh, bad, bad, bad. That leads to chafing and that is not good. But basically here, the heat from rubbing um, allows graphite to be grabbed by eraser. So yeah, so that's how pencils work. That's kind of all of that in a nutshell. I'll try and make sure that I link in the description box below to all of the sources that I used for this. Um, I'll also link to, I think pencils.com has a really good description of kind of how pencils are made, the, how the whole slap process works and all of that. So I'll make sure to link to that as well. And yeah, that's kind of how pencils work. That's how graphite works. That's how graphite gets into a pencil. That's how um, we actually make marks on paper with graphite and then how we can remove those marks that we've made. So that's all I got. I hope this was useful, maybe kind of sort of. I hope it was informational. If you have other things you'd like me to maybe talk about, I'd like to start doing these sciencey things more often. So let me know. Let me know what you'd like to see. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.